Alrighty guys, welcome back to the workshop. Today will be a demonstration of how the craft of knife making fosters problem solving skills for the maker. This project started off as a large buoy, but in a shocking turn of events full of great emotional trauma, it ended up a kitchen knife. I started off with 15 5 inch long and 1 and 1 half inch wide cutoffs of 1084 and 15 and 20. The first step is to get these pieces ground flat and clean, then welded together. I'm new to making Damascus, but I've already come to learn that preparation is everything when trying to have good welds and when trying to conserve as much steel as possible. Before we get started forge welding, I figured it was time to add a front slag catcher to my new hydraulic press. I found that without this slag catcher, my work area was getting pretty messy. This baking pan was a perfect fit for my machine. All I had to do was drill and tap some holes into the press body and bolt the pan on with some quarter 20 fasteners. To empty the pan, I plan on leaving it on the machine and using my shop vac. With this Damascus billet, I plan on not using any borax as flux. I will be relying solely on the reducing atmosphere in my forge and kerosene. I found that this worked fairly well coupled with my steel prep cleaning process. The initial press is the most important since it sets the weld, so I lightly press the billet and quickly get it back into the forge. I've been doing this twice per new stack and I haven't had any issues forge welding thus far. This Damascus billet taught me a few things about steel conservation. During the process of making a pattern welded billet, you lose a lot of good steel with grinding, cutting, and stacking. If you're going to be trying for more intricate patterns, you'll lose even more steel. There are three things that I learned this time around that helped with this issue. One of them I did, and the other two I fell short on. The first thing that helped me conserve steel was using kiss blocks. I found that ending each drawing out cycle with a very flat and uniform billet paid dividends in the cleanup process. By having a uniform thickness on both the flats and the sides, the amount of grinding was greatly reduced. The second finding was to make sure the sides of the stack were as flush as possible. On my last stack, I went so far as to grind the sides flush with each other after welding the ends securely. This greatly reduces the amount of grinding that is needed on the sides of your billet after forge welding, since an overlap of pieces generally results in a cold shut. And lastly, I used the butcher block brush to brush off scale. I did this more diligently towards the end of the process and found it to work very well. I then got lazy when forging the blade and found a significant amount of scale buildup on my knife which in part resulted to more grinding, less steel, and a thinner knife. I purchased my butcher block brush on Amazon and will put a link in the description below if you're looking to pick one up. After I got this billet up to 240 layers, I decided to try for a more advanced pattern than just random pattern in Damascus. But before we get started on that, I want to do a test etch so you can see what we're working with. This is what 240 layers looks like on a fairly thick billet. I then take a quarter inch drill bit and get the drilling holes on each side of our steel. I'm shooting for holes around one third of the thickness of the billet. One rookie mistake I made was not chamfering these holes. My counter bores have very sharp points and would bottom out in the hole before contacting the edge of the hole. I didn't think of it at the time, but I could have just used a large drill bit to chamfer these holes. This mistake resulted in me having to grind off even more steel on the finished billet, and it was a contributing factor to this knife ending up as a kitchen knife instead of a buoy. But with all that being said, the raindrop pattern did turn out looking pretty good. Now that we have our steel sorted out, I'm going to attempt to forge out my blade. My forging skills have a long way to come, and I think it's very apparent with this footage. At the end of the day, I'm just going to need more practice in this round. I've watched a ton of instructional videos on forging knives, but no amount of research is a substitute for getting in the shop and hammering out some blades. One major mistake I made with this blade was getting too aggressive when hammering in the Ricasso area. I had a very deep hammer blow right on the Ricasso of this knife, which was the last nail in the coffin that turned this buoy into a kitchen knife. I also was not diligent with my butcher block brush and had a decent amount of scale growth on the surface of my work. Once I have my crude blade shaped out, I focused on drawing out the tang straighten everything up, and then annealed the blade in vermiculite. After it cools down, this is what we're left with. At this point, I still think I can make a buoy out of it, and I haven't come to realize my mistake on the Ricasso. I get to the grinder to clean up the forge scale on the blade and roughen the tang and shoulder area. I use the surface grinding attachment to get my Ricasso fairly flat and parallel before tracing my blade profile on the steel and cutting out the bulk of excess material on the bandsaw. I'm gonna be saving all my cut off Damascus pieces so I can make a fossil canister Damascus in the future. Everything I'm doing on the grinder at this point is just getting things roughed in. My finished grinding will be done post heat treatment. I did decide to mill in my shoulders at this point before heat treating 
Although with the switch to a kitchen knife, I ended up going back and doing them over again post heat treat. To mill in my shoulders, I clamped the blade in my file guide and then clamped the file guide in my mill vise. I used a carbide eighth of an inch end mill to establish the radius in the shoulder and the flat along the top of the tang. I used a dial indicator on my table to let me know when I was zeroed out with the shoulder. I then raised the end mill and moved the table to the other side of the knife and milled in that side. This ensures my shoulders are in line with each other. Next up is the heat treat. This will be the second knife that I use my DIY heat treating furnace on. I didn't show the whole process, but I do multiple normalizing cycles with this blade starting at 1650 degrees. I quench the blade at around 1475 degrees in Parks 50 for four to five seconds and then clamp it in my straightening vise. This ensures my blade is held straight as it cools. I've been using this method for a while now and have had great results keeping my blade straight. I then clamp the blade in between two pieces of angle iron to hold it straight during the tempering process. I will be tempering this blade at 410 degrees Fahrenheit for two two hour cycles. In between cycles, I cool the blade to room temperature by dunking it in water. This does not negatively affect the knife and speeds up the tempering process. Now that we have a heat treated blade, I take it over to the surface grinder to get it cleaned up. The heat treating process in the oven leaves a little scale behind on the surface since oxygen is present inside the furnace. This has me considering using stainless steel foil in the future. It's around this time that I realize my blade is too thin after having to remove a good deal of steel fighting the deep gouge in my Ricasso. In an epic switching of direction, I begin to reprofile this knife into a kitchen knife. Let this be a lesson to anyone thinking about throwing a knife into the scrap bin. We've come too far to give up now. Now that I have the blade reprofiled, I can start grinding in my bevels. I mark out my center line on the surface plate and go to town with the blade with a new 60 grit Norton belt. After two thirds of the way through this process, I remembered I had a misting system and should have been using it. The last thing I want at this point in the game is to overheat my edge. Luckily, I did not. I ended up taking this blade up to a 320 grit belt finish and then I used a 300 grit slack belt to round over the spine of this knife. I feel like this makes it nicer to use in the kitchen. I also wanted to round over the choil area on the blade. To do this, I took some electrical tape and attached it to the back of 320 and 600 grit sandpaper. This gives the sandpaper a little more support and reduces the chances of breakage. With a shoe shining motion, I rounded over the choil area and brought it up to a 600 grit finish. I then moved on to my blade bevels, starting with a 320 grit sandpaper and a hard backer. I sanded the knife to a diagonal scratch pattern with a 320 grit and then eventually along the length of the blade with a 600 grit paper. A 600 grit finish will be as far as I take this knife before etching the Damascus. The uniformity of the 600 grit doesn't need to be perfect. In the words of Nick Wheeler, it can be a quote, dirty 600 grit. At this point, I'll etch in my maker's mark with my DIY etching machine built based on Chris Crawford's plans. I hit the stencil around 15 times on DC power for a deep etch, and then a few times on AC power to darken it some. After I have it etched, you can see my mark is a little blurry. A few swipes with the 600 grit paper will clean this up nicely. We will be making a wah style handle for this knife out of a piece of box elder that I've had for about 16 years now. From what I can tell it was stabilized, however, I'm not sure where it came from. Using a face mill on my mini mill, I'll get this block squared up. I did find some voids on this block that I attempted to fill with some super glue off camera later in the build, so the stabilization job may have been done by an amateur. Jeremy at Simple Little Life put out some videos a while back on how to construct wah handles with a wood dowel. He said he learned this method from Noah Valkron, so major shout out to both of these gentlemen since this will be the method we use in this video. I started off by using a one half of an inch center cutting end mill to make a hole in my ironwood bolster around three quarters of an inch deep. This leaves me with around 200 thousandths for me to slot. I found these two millimeter end mills on Amazon that I'll be using for my slot, which worked out to around 78 thousandths. I picked up this manual table stop method from Carl Anderson and it makes the slotting process pretty easy once set up. This operation can certainly be done with drill bits and hand files. However, buying the appropriate size end mill and machining the slot is a time saver. This seems especially true with smaller slots. Once I have the slot milled, there is a tiny amount of hand fitting to do in order to square up the radius left behind by the end mill. I put my guard jack on the tang just to apply some pressure onto the bolster and see how my fit was looking. Overall, I'm pretty darn happy with this fit and no daylight is visible when looking at the assembly from the side. Next, we'll use the one half of an inch end mill to drill a hole in our G10 spacer, then move on to the piece of box elder. 
I got the box elder squared up in my mill vise using the machine is square. I previously measured my tang and marked the depth on the end mill with a sharpie. If I recall correctly, I'll be drilling this hole into the box elder about two and three quarters of an inch deep. I didn't clamp the box elder tight enough and you can see a little wobble at the start of its operation until I noticed and tightened the vise. While we're here in the mill and set up square to the hole I just drilled, I decided to face mill the front of this block. There really isn't anything special about the half inch dowels that we're using, I picked them up from the local hardware store for this project. I made a little skid to hold the dowel and slotted it with my porter band. I also drilled a hole in the bottom of the dowel to prevent any hydraulic lockup when assembling the handle with epoxy. So this is how the components of our handle are going to fit together. Before we assemble the handle, I need to modify some clamps. Using a 5 16 of an inch end mill, I mill out a slot in the face of the two clamps. This slot will allow the clamp to fit around the blade and hold the handle together. This is the real beauty of the method outlined by Noah and Jeremy, since it allows you to put the handle together, epoxy the components securely, remove the blade, and shape the handle off the knife. To epoxy these components together, I'm using some rogue epoxy from Combat Abrasives, which seem to set in about 15 minutes. Jeremy said he uses five minute epoxy for this setup, but since this is my first time trying it, I wanted to have a little time cushion. I found that assembling the handle with the box elder clamped in the vise was pretty convenient. Once I get it all arranged, I use my modified clamps to hold the handle pieces firmly together. I then watch the clock and continuously check if my leftover epoxy is setting. If you wait too long, you may not be able to remove the knife from your handle, so pay attention. I probably waited just a little too long since the knife was pretty difficult to get out. Luckily, with a little finagling, the knife came free and I was left with a nice semi-bedded tang. This process can be a little touch and go. I think it really comes down to practice and familiarity with the specific epoxy setting time that you're using. I left the handle alone for a bit so that the epoxy can cure and then started cleaning it up on the belt sander. My goal here was just to get the three layers of material flush with each other. My piece of box elder was already pretty small, so I wanted to make sure not to reduce it any further. The next step will be burning out any epoxy that restricts our tang's movement in the slot, which will give us a near perfect fit. To do this, I lightly heated the tip of the tang and inserted it into the slot multiple times until the shoulder bottoms out on the ironwood. Jeremy recommends not heating your tang to a red hot and shooting for around 400 and 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Once we're burned in, I'll take this time to notch the tang in order to help lock it into the handle on the final glue up. Using the one, two, three blocks, a height gauge with a pencil clamp to it and my surface plate, I scribe some lines on my handle to make sure they're parallel to my Ricasso. Then I ground down to these lines on the flat platen of my 2x72. To make a pinch grip more comfortable on this kitchen knife, I use a 2 inch contact wheel on my work rest to grind in some curvature on the front of the handle. And finally, I marked out some target grind lines on the corners in order to turn this square block into an octagonal handle. The beauty of this wah handling method, championed by Noah and Jeremy, is that you can remove the handles from the knife to do your shaping. This gives a knife maker much more control over the handle shaping process and reduces the chances of damaging the blade. I'm finding with most of my builds nowadays that having the handle separate from the knife when shaping is a very nice luxury. Once I have the handle sanded to 1000 grit, I hit it lightly with the buffing wheel and some green buffing compound. I don't know much about buffing, however I think that I need to try out some of the finer white compound for handles in the future. That being said, I really like the way this handle turned out. Now that the handle is ready, we can etch our blade. I'm going to be putting together a more permanent, longer, and wider tank for my shop with this 3-inch PVC pipe. When purchasing my 24-inch piece of 3-inch PVC, I also bought a floor flange and a threaded cap. I thought that I had some leftover PVC-specific glue, so I didn't buy any at the store. However, once I got back to the shop, I couldn't find it. So I put the acid tank together with Rogue two-part epoxy from Combat Abrasives. I'm really not sure how this will hold up, but it's been a few weeks now and I haven't had any leaks, so I guess time will tell. I made a mix of one part ferric chloride and two parts filtered water for this tank. I must say that I was surprised at how weak the mix was. It took a significantly longer amount of time to etch my blade with this mixture than my previous one to one solution that is three years old. It could be a combination of the one to three versus the one to one ratio and the brand of ferric chloride I purchased. Either way, I ended up having to run 20 minute etching cycles on the blade to get a decent etch. Between etching cycles, I cleaned the blade with an extra fine steel wool, and on my last etching cycle, I sprayed the blade off with ammonianized Windex, and I heavily coated the blade with baking soda to neutralize the acid. The last thing you want is for the acid to be left on your blade long term.
With the blade complete, we can now glue on the handle, which is about 95% complete. To do this, I'll be using some G-Flex epoxy from West Systems. I also purchased this huge 24 inch DeWalt clamp for this project specifically. I like the large jaw version of this clamp for this operation since it seems to have a more even clamping pressure. Once the epoxy has had time to cure, it's time to finish the back end handle. I brought the back end up to 1000 grit and then put a small radius on the edge by hand. Lastly, we need to put an edge in this guy. Normally, I'd go straight to my housework sharpening system on my 2x72, however with this knife I wanted to hit a specific secondary bevel angle of around 17.5 degrees. So I set the angle using my wind water cooled sharpener and then moved over to the housework system to refine the edge at a higher grit. I found that once you have the secondary bevel established, it's easier to match it on the housework sharpening system. However, I wasn't confident enough in my current skills to go straight to it on this specific knife. With all that being said, this process put a darn good edge on the blade, and I have some sweet slow motion footage of a sharpness test here to prove that point. Alrighty, so this is how it turned out. While it's not the original buoy I planned to make, I'm frankly happy that I was able to finish a knife out of this project. Throughout the process of making this knife, I've learned a ton about making Damascus that I hope to apply in future projects. I was also afforded the opportunity to practice my kitchen knife construction by making some mistakes. This knife feels good in the hand, it's definitely sharp, and I really like how it finished up aesthetically with the raindrop Damascus and the box elder handle. As always, I hope you all enjoyed this video and maybe got something out of my mistakes. If you did, please hit that like button and consider subscribing to the channel to guarantee that you'll see future content. If you'd like to support the channel financially, you can check out Redbeard Ops on Patreon or tip directly to Redbeard Ops via this Bitcoin QR code. And with that, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.